My name is Len Nassifer. I'm a professor of American Indian Studies at the University of Arizona. I'm from the Navajo Nation. I'm also the CEO and founder of Outdoor Apparel Company, Natives Outdoors, and professional adventurer. I grew up in a place called Saley, Arizona, which is on the north rim of Canyon de Chelly. I went to school in Kansas for my undergrad and then lived in Pennsylvania. Lived in DC for a little bit and I most recently lived in Denver. The move to Tucson was, I think, needed. It's great to be a part of the state that I actually haven't spent a whole lot of time in. Mountain biking is awesome around the area, trail running, of course hiking, but one that I've been exploring the most has been climbing. Natives Outdoors is an apparel company we also specialize in consulting and storytelling. One of the things that we see is that a lot of tribes are on or near very scenic places. There's a really big opportunity to build an outdoor industry on tribal lands with native people. We worked with the Parks and Wildlife on their statewide comprehensive outdoor recreation plan. They actually engaged with the tribes and we helped facilitate that. So we're just basically using our company as a conduit for that through our products, through the types of stories that we tell. We're at Kochi Stronghold. It's the ancestral homelands of the Apache and the Tohono O'odham. There's a really cool story here about how Geronimo and 40 other Apaches outran the U.S. Cavalry for like nine months in these mountains. Aaron Mike is the owner of Pangea Mountain Guides in Tucson, Arizona. He's also one of my core partners with Natives Outdoors. We'll be scrambling around some rocks, climbing. Being in Arizona and in southern Arizona, that means we have a wealth of granite. Cochise Stronghold is separated into two parts. Both sides have pretty massive domes that are available for climbing. One of the things that we'll get out of our climbing session is just to become efficient on moving over this stone. My first time going and climbing in Cochise. I'm really stoked to put that together. It's a place that I've read a lot about because of the history. I consider this my church, quite honestly, as these places and, you know, being outdoors and being climbing, I think it always grounds me in a big way. All right, hey, Lynn, you're on belay, man. You can climb when you're ready. Okay, climbing. Climb on. Oh, this is trippy rock. I know, dude, welcome to Cochise. Yeah, buddy. It's ending, man. Keep it up. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Dude, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> nice, man. Another adventure, dude. These places have significance. They mean something to people. They're sacred places. Ensuring that as many folks have access to these places is important. I started cycling late. I didn't get on a road bike until I was 31 years old. Really, my path toward becoming a pro cyclist was grit and hope and persistence and luck. But a lot of that happened because I based myself here in Tucson with the right community and the right training tools. My name is Catherine Bertine. I'm the founder and CEO of Homestretch Foundation based here in Tucson, Arizona. Homestretch Foundation is a residence where female professional athletes who struggle with the gender pay gap can reside and live and train for free while they're residents here. When I got my first professional contract in 2012, I then raced professionally for five years. Only one of those five years was I paid above the poverty line. And the men at the elite world tour level earned a base salary. That really ignited the activism spark for me. So we developed the Home Stretch Foundation. We were able to secure the funding to buy the house to make this a reality. I found out about the Home Stretch Foundation when it was just an idea in Catherine's head. Fast forward to now, I'm transitioning from pro cycling into being here as the general manager and being a mentor for the women, but in a professional cycling role. The culture that we create in the home just opened my eyes to the idea of us giving to each other. And I want to push you as hard as I can. You know, it's going to make you better. It's going to make me better. And I want to give you that confidence and that ability to, to be the best you. We chose to be based here in Tucson because it's really the best cycling place in the Southwest, if not the country. 
We have the most amazing topography. We've got something for every type of rider, whether you're a climber or a sprinter. We've got Mount Lemmon, which is an amazing 9,000 foot climb that goes through just about every ecosystem possible from desert to tundra. We also have these fantastic group rides that truly create you know, the strongest cyclist possible. What's so great about Tucson is seeing all these different places and coming back here and realizing the roads that you have here to train on and the people that you have to train with and the community that is built around cycling and for cycling. Whatever you want, it's here. There's this saying among Arizonans, they'll say, the desert brings you back. And there is something about Arizona, and for me specifically Tucson, where I felt the call, you know, the desert brings you back. And sure enough, it did. And I still love it just as much as when I got here, if not more, <laughs> because, uh, because of the, that sense of people and community that has kept me. I love it. My name is Helen Mehmedinovic, and I'm a filmmaker. I grew up in Bosnia. That's kind of where I fell in love with nature. And when I came to US and went to UCLA to study film, I would try to get away out of LA and Northern Arizona would be the spot. So I would try to always stop at places like Vermilion Cliffs here, Grand Canyon, somewhere in the Navajo Reservation. Those would be some of my favorite spots. Of all the places that I could live, why would I settle and live a certain amount of time in Arizona? And the reason is that it just energetically feels right. Anybody that has any sense of adventure should gravitate to such a place. Night photography especially is surprising, and it makes each shoot its own unique, fun experience. What's beautiful about astrophotography is that whether you want it to be or not, it's actually an activist kind of photography. And I say that because anybody that sees the night sky in its pristine form is gonna have the question, what is that? They're gonna know, like, how is, is that possible? Is that real? Yes, it's real. Well, why didn't I see it? Well, you don't see it because of light pollution. When we say light pollution, we mean artificial light. It washes out all the night skies. I went into the whole night sky photography as a way to have fun. At some point, I think me and a shooting partner of mine, Gavin Heffern, and we started talking, how can we make this a bigger project than just having fun? We concluded that inevitably we gotta talk light pollution. We need to photograph some of the best places, some of the worst places left when it comes to night skies, try to educate people. We were kicking around different names and this name Sky Glow made a lot of sense. These beautiful cliffs are the Vermilion Cliffs, and it's a national monument. Inside of Vermilion Cliffs are several really special places. One of them is the Wave, the other one is White Pocket. And White Pocket is uh, basically sand dunes that were here millions of years ago. The oceans rose, and as they rose, they elitified it. So they turned what was once pure sand to um, these pockets of just sandstone rock. And it's unique, it's not really found anywhere else. It's a very dark area, very beautiful. It's also very quiet. You have to keep checking if you lost your hearing because it's so quiet, and I love that. In uh, Northern Arizona and in parts of Southern Arizona, we have some of the darkest skies that are left pretty much anywhere on the continent. Seeing these beautiful images of stars is a way to start a talk with a person and say, there's these beautiful places that are still left. Please go enjoy them, please protect them. And of course, there is a bit of a, a double-edged sword with that. Too many people in national parks can produce problems as well. But I still think overall, we need more in touch with nature.